Hi there and welcome to Sector Report. Join me this week for a trip to Fielding where we explore the country's elite dairy stud breeders. This year was the third for dairy event which allows all the breed societies to gather in one place at one time, show their cows and compete for those coveted red ribbons. We take in one of the show's highlights, the Semex Youth Challenge, featuring the stud breeding industry's up and coming young people strutting their stuff as they prepare their animals for the ring. An Australian judge also talks me through what he looks for in a prize car. His example, the show's supreme champion Holstein Friesian. And I get the latest information from dairy event chairman and top breeder Selwyn Donald. The World Jersey Bureau held its international conference in conjunction with the dairy event. Join me as I talk with the Secretary of the World Jersey Cattle Bureau, James Godfrey, who hails, you guessed it, from the island of Jersey. But first, let's join those six teams of Youth Challenge contestants. A scene that's nearly as old as agriculture itself in this country, bar a few differences in dress in the ring and the latest in technology. On display, the cream of our stud dairy cows and their proud breeders. This year, the third for the dairy event at Manfield Park Stadium and Fielding has attracted record entries with breeders from Canterbury and the West Coast up to the South Waikato converging on this venue. This year's dairy event also coincides with the World Jersey Conference show, which brought 100 delegates from 17 countries. So that gentle and popular breed had a high profile here. A highlight of this year's events was the Semex Youth Team Challenge, which had six teams of four each competing in the skills necessary to prepare a cow for showing. And indeed, to show her in the ring and to judge the animals. So what are you up to here? What are you trying to achieve with the cow? Trying to sit the top line, so just trying to blow the gear up. Trying to, so, so this makes your back look nice and straight the whole way along. Oh, okay. So it improves the overall look of yeah, the cow. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, she's getting a blow dry. Yeah, Hello, girl. Yeah, Look me. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> oh, that tastes very strange. <laughs> so, what are you trying to achieve with this car? Uh, what I'm doing at the moment is sort of a, what we call a top line. Um, trying to sort of cut it, blow it up so and then cut it out so it's straight across the top. Gives the cow well, a lot of balance. So is it quite tricky to do? I think so, it's too bad, but... but she you looks can have, like you she's... Can have, you can have your moments when the cow's moving around like that. Yeah. Well, she's a pretty young animal too, isn't yeah, she? Yeah. So she's going to be a bit skittish. Yeah. yeah. They learn a lot of valuable skills. That it's not only just showing the cows, it's... Uh, They've got to work teamwork, uh, they're really going to learn communication and um, have an idea of how the animal's going to look at the end and, and set about doing it. And also it seems by uh, talking to a few of them, also handle some pretty skittish animals which aren't really enjoying the experience much. That's probably right and that's part of the teamwork and knowing how to handle animals. And They're extremely good, uh, each of the group, if you've watched the, the, the animals started, they've all settled down, they've worked good as a group and, uh, and they're starting to get them looking pretty good by now. So how are they comparing to previous years so far? I mean, I know we're only in the first stage. I made the interesting comment on the microphone a minute ago. I thought the, the first thing I noticed was they were prepared. Uh, and the preparation uh, each year gets a little bit better. I think the competitions are very close and, and they also know that they, they need to do a good job right from the start. There's many different facets in the competition, so you need to do every bit good. What are you doing here? Just spraying fair magic in the tails. It's stronger than hairspray, it won't rub off. It holds the tail in no matter what. Keep it all fluffed up. The judges like that, do they? Well, I do. You do? <laughs> Fair enough. Well, she's only a yearling? Yeah, oh, and she, she would never have been clipped before. No. She's only just been broken into the halter as well. Right. 
so it's going to be, he's not going to be too happy to no. begin with anyway. Is it quite tricky to do this um, around the head? Not really. Oh, it's just a lot of angles that you've got to go on. Yes, you've got a lot of curves there. Goodness me, just watching you here, the attention to detail on a cow's ear is unbelievable. Why are you being so fussy? Because we're getting judged for it, so I really want to get it clean and not let the team down. <laughs> but would you normally get it to this standard if you were just showing it? Uh, it depends show. how good the animal is and how clean I like it. So have you found it quite tricky to, to, to get the animal up to the standard that you want? Oh, not really. We practice and we do quite a bit of clipping separately, but not really all together. Right. So how much practice would you do? How many weeks before this? Together? Yeah. Not at all. Not this at all. is our first time this year together. Oh, but you practice individually. Yeah. Yeah. Time's up for this, the first section of the challenge, prepping the cows for showing. Then it's the turn of the Australian judges to tell contestants what they think of their skills. Jim Conroy talks about one group that had a small crisis when their cow became distressed and tangled up with the stall. The good part about that was the cool attitude of the man up front who kept calling the instructions and kept everybody safe. And um, so that was a really high point from my point of view of this team. that. Whilst the heifer got quite uh, distressed and got tangled up in the crate, the young man up front kept his cool, called his team members what to do, and uh, that was a very, very positive part of the, the deal for these guys. On the animal itself, I think they've done a good job. Uh, they've assessed the animal out quite well. Uh, they, they've clipped her uh, both sides, and they've put a top one on, and they've left a little bit of hair underneath. If I'm going to give them any pointers, I'd say when you first come out, you must be aware that both sides of the animal need to be clipped the same. If you have a look, at the, the, uh, the, the clipper blades on one side are a lot shorter than the other. And just leave a little bit of line. If you get, get on the other side of the animal, you see a little bit of line. Welcome back. Well, we've seen the cows being prepped for the ring. Now it's time to watch the Youth Challenge team's handling skills as they parade animals and are later judged on their skills as judges themselves. And later, Australian judge John Gardner talks us through what he looks for in a supreme champion cow. The next stage for these Youth Challenge competitors is a test of their skills at handling the cows in the ring, an important part of showing off their expensive charges with their high-powered genetics. At the moment we've got uh, six young people who are in the process of assessing the attributes of each animal and uh, they'll, be, they'll be getting a picture in their mind of, of, the, of the best animal through to the one that's not quite as good. And, uh, so we're giving them two minutes to parade the animals and, and assess them walking because of course dairy cows have to walk and so legs and feet are a major part of that issue with farms getting bigger and distances that they have to travel. So legs and feet and walking is a major, major thing. So then once they've, they've been paraded for, for two minutes then we'll, we'll line them up across the centre of the ring and which will enable the judges to get in close and have a, have a real good look at, at things like um, chest width, strength, uh, capacity and, and, and the things that of course the modern dairy cow needs these days with that they've got to travel big distances they've got to eat you know different types of, of feed uh, and then convert that of course into milk so these are only uh, heifers uh, pregnant heifers uh, yet to have a lactation mm -hmm. so it's uh, a work in progress you, you might say so so in this leg of the competition then these are potential judges who are being judged for their ability to judge in the ring. That's correct. We've got our Australian uh, overjudge, and, he, and he's assessing uh, the, the, the way that they treat the exhibitors, the way that they, they move around the ring so as they, they're not going to frighten the animal. Mm. Um, but they're also they're not going to impede the, the, the person on the holder from showing the animal off to the best of its ability. And of course we're always looking to accentuate the, the good and perhaps hide the bad. And then it's the turn of one from each of the six teams to show whether he or she has the skills to finally graduate to the role of judge. I like her um, straight top line and um, her openness of rib. And uh, fourth, uh, she's a nice cow. Um, she has um, a good strong front and thank you. I do like this cow we have in second. I think she's very nice. She blends well through the shoulder. She's got a good rump. She walks out on a good set of feet and legs. This cow we have in third, 
just letting that wee bit of power through her, the shoulder, but I still admire this cow we have here. I think she's going to be a tremendous animal when she's older. She may be lacking a wee bit of dairiness, but I still think she's a tremendous dairy animal. I really like this heifer. She's tall, she's long, she's dairy, and it's just the length and the height that gets her over this uh, heifer in second. Also, I give her the slight advantage in the, uh, the pin setting and the thurl placement than the cow in second. Uh, the cow in second or the cow in third, uh, I think she just shows a wee bit more uh, cleanliness down through the thigh than the cow in third. Also, I give her the advantage she stands higher on her pastons than the cow in third. I congratulate the young competitors and the placings and the reasons that they've given why they've placed their animals one over two, two over three, three over four. You've also got to remember, judging is a personal preference thing. There's a standard that we look for and a standard of confirmation, and sometimes that's a little bit breed specific as well. As well as their abilities with their animals, these young contestants are tested on their presentation skills. These judges of the future have to be able to give opinions with authority when they're in the ring. So they were given topics with five minutes to prepare for an impromptu speech. The first young contestant had to talk up one particular breed. The Holstein Frisian cow is a good all-round dairy cow and suits all climates in most areas of New Zealand. Get them in your herd today. Thank you. This young lady had to convince her audience that all a woman on a farm needs for a good wardrobe these days is overalls and a pair of gumboots. They're excellent for people on a budget. You can be, get a good pair of overalls for 40 bucks, good pair of gumboots for 70. The competition was rounded out with a general knowledge quiz, most of it with questions related to the dairy industry, but a few from left field, like who is Prince William getting married to? Who is the CEO of Fonterra? Andrew Ferrier. Gee, these questions were easy, weren't they? What is the average gestation length of a cow? 283 days, yes, that's right. Third on genetics won the quiz, but the overall winners of this year's Semex Youth Team Challenge were the Manawatu Turbo Fitters. A demanding test of human skills, but hey, what about the animals? What does a judge look for in a pedigree cow? Well, Australian judge John Gardner talked me through this rather obscure skill with the supreme champion Holstein, a cow he says is elite enough to compete anywhere in the world. It comes back to what we would call functional cows. Right. And everything that we look for in a supreme cow is what we would say is a functional cow that can go back into our herds and convert grass into milk. So every trait that we look for has to be a functional trait. When we look for a cow, when they come towards us in the judging room, we like to see them tracking wide on her front legs right. because that's an indication of a width of chest. Right. If she's standing close together, yeah. it tells us that there isn't as much width of chest as there should be. And for every 25 litres of milk that a cow produces, there's 10,000 litres of oxygenated blood that has to pump through her mammary system Good to, to produce that 25 litres of milk. Yeah. So if she's narrow chested, that's restricting the ability to pump that amount of blood, gotcha. oxygenated blood through her mammary system. Right. But the, what, if she's got that width of chest, it's telling us that she can do that far more easily than a cow that's narrower in the chest. What about anything in the head that you look for? We look for femininity in the head like as in cleanness, mm -hmm. not a heavy, um, strong head, but we obviously look for a wide muzzle. Yeah. When you stand in front, the muzzle needs to be wide. If it's a narrow muzzle, she's got to take extra mouthfuls of grass to, to actually swallow. Right. When she's got a wide muzzle, she can take one mouthful and a it's one mouthful instead of three or four to get the same amount. Now just finally looking at the udder, how does this udder compare to what you see on a lot of Frisian? Well it, this is an extremely high quality udder. Yeah. When this cow has been milked out and she's probably not long milked, but it just totally collapses. Yeah. And that's all milk making tissue. So that when she milks out there's no fleshiness in the udder. Right. Um, a cow that doesn't collapse as much and she's got more fleshiness in the udder it means that she's carrying extra weight around her, in her udder when she's walking to and back from the dairy and it's not milk making tissue. And when you consider a cow may be producing up to 50 and 60 litres a day, which for twice a day milking is anywhere from 25 litres to 30 litres per milking, yeah. she's carrying that plus the weight of that udder. So if it's all soft texture, 
there's less weight to carry around in that odour. Australian judge John Gardner there explaining the fine points that he looks for in the dairy event Supreme Champion. Next up, I talk to the event chairman Selwyn Donald and visiting World Jersey Bureau Secretary James Godfrey, who's come out to New Zealand from the island of Jersey. Well, welcome to Sector Report here on Country 99 TV, Selwyn. Now, just before I went out and got you to bring you in, you were staring fixedly into the ring and told me that you'd in fact just won the Ayrshire Supreme Award for the whole show. Uh, that must be making you feel pretty good. Yes, it's great for my daughter and your husband. Um, they won the Supreme Ayrshire exhibit of the show for the dairy event. So, yeah, very, very delighted for them and for us as well. And you've won a few other top awards during this show. Yeah, we've had a, we've actually had a great day, both with the Ayrshires today, um, we've had a couple of prize winners, and we've also had a really good day with the Jersey cows yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the young fellows that was helping us also took out the uh, Premier Leader for his age group. So all in all, it's been a very successful time. So what is the advantage for a breeder like you winning such a prestigious award, really? I mean, I presume it brings, obviously, an economic benefit with it in that the uh, AB companies will be looking for the daughters of the progeny of that, of that um, car, won't they? Well, it, it's the opportunity to market your genetics and, um, you know, to enhance your stud, your profile of your stud. Um, particular cows, they, all of a sudden they get splashed around the media and written nice things about them and uh, all those sorts of things. So it gives you that opportunity then to go out and sell their offspring mm. to um, not only the public but also to your own breeding operation. Um, which can, you know, obviously be more profitable. So, mm. For those of us who don't really understand the intricacies of this breeding sort of top pedigree cattle, uh, I take it involves flushing embryos and there's obviously a lot of emphasis on, on the male progeny. Male and female because obviously people want to get um, their, their line of the family as well. So, yeah, it's, it, once you get, you know, recognition and, and success like they've had, well then it gives you more of an opportunity to flush them, to get the embryos out of them, implant them, and then people buy and, and um, yeah, so it's, it's a win-win for us, but it's also a win for other farmers to um, enhance their breeding operations. What's the success rate with flushing in terms of taking hold? Look, you, could, oh, you can flush a cow out and get absolutely nothing, or you can flush a cow and get 20 or 30 eggs. Each cow is a little different, um, but the hold rate is around the 60 odd percent. Right. So yeah, it's not too bad. Well, so and tell me, why should agriculture throughout this country really be taking great notice of this dairy event? What is so important about it? Well, it's really important that we're focusing very much on the youth um, because every farm is getting older and older and it's not the new ones coming through that have got the same passion for showing cattle and exhibiting cattle. Mm. And so that's a really big thing is the the advantage for that. And it's also to showcase um, their breeds against each other. Look, we've got cows from the South Island, uh, from far north as well. Um, so it's like the old test match rugby sort of thing. And everyone comes and, and they want to win. So, yeah, and I think that everyone wants to come along and see, you know, the good cows out on display. Is showing cattle an important part of the dairy industry overall, do you think? For us, passionate guys about showing, it's, it's like having a hobby, um, but it's a hobby that you take your occupation away with and you, you know, my wife always says to me, uh, we're going on holiday with our cows again or <laughs> are we actually going on holiday to uh, sit by the bit at sea and do something, but uh, we also get, we go to cow conferences, so that's our holiday, so. <laughs> but it, it's good to mix and mingle and, you know, to, to grasp scorn and, and take forward your, your profile, your stud. Uh, out to the community and, and uh, yeah, there's, there's good marketing ability. You don't have to show cows to have pedigree cows, that's the most important thing. Right. Registered cows, we believe all breed societies with registered cows, they add value to their asset. Do you think among rank and file working dairy farmers there is enough awareness of the importance of breeding and genetics? Um, everyone has different philosophies on their breeding but um, a lot of people now are swinging back to looking at how these tremendous cow families and, and the production with, with amongst some of these elite herds around New Zealand, how they've got there, and uh, they're starting to sit up and take notice. 
Well, in the past, of course, breeding has been a, a bit of a hit and miss affair, but of course, science has got itself heavily involved now with genetics um, and, you know, DNA science. Um, has this had much of an effect on people like you who are professional breeders? Oh, it certainly has helped us immensely. You know, when you've got the recording, the milk recording and, and the DNA profiling, you actually know what you are buying off an AB company, this way of a sort straw of semen. That has actually been DNA profiled, so you know it is exactly what it is. And with the genotypes, the, the milk and the, you know, all those sorts of things is very important. So, yeah, it's something we look at all the time. Is crossbreeding a threat to the industry? Um, I don't think it is. There is an element in New Zealand and a lot of dairy farmers like crossbreed cows and that's fine, but they've had to start from somewhere and it's the two pure breeds that they've, they've taken and watered down. Um, I personally have no problem with the crossbreed breeding cows. Uh, those guys are happy to milk them, but I'm happy to keep my cows pure and uh, will do so in the future. Well, that was Selwyn Donald, the chairman of the dairy event and also himself a top breeder. Next, I caught up with James Godfrey, who's out here from the island of Jersey. Well, James, welcome to the Sector Report here on Country 99 TV and indeed welcome to New Zealand. Now, my first question obviously is about the Jersey breed. Now, you come from the island of that name, but I suspect it's not just patriotism that lies behind your enthusiasm for this particular breed of cow. So what is it that's so great about the Jersey, particularly when you compare it to other breeds? Well, uh, thank you very much, and it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time in New Zealand, so oh, it's right. been a really interesting experience for me. Mm. What is it about the Jersey breed? Well, it, it's not the fact that I come from the island that, no, no, that, I uh, that. in any way colours my opinion on it, although it, uh, yes, I have perhaps more of an affection for it than, than um, more commercial uh, people might do. Yeah. But what we've found um, is all over the world that the Jersey breed is in a growth situation. And it's in a growth situation because of a number of factors. It's the efficiency of the breed, the ease of management of the breed, the, the healthiness of it, the fertility. There's a whole range of factors that are making commercial dairy producers take a second look at the breed, and, and many are converting over from breeds that are perhaps more common now, maybe the Holstein Friesian. So the Holstein Friesians that we have here in such numbers, they'd be too big? We're finding, I suppose, many of the, the breeders who've converted from Holsteins into Jerseys have done so for reasons such as you know, the breed is getting bigger and bigger, getting harder to manage in, in some countries, particularly Europe, where buildings are constructed around a certain size and are very expensive to construct. Mm. Having built cubicle housing for a certain size cow, if that cow is getting bigger and bigger, they're faced with, with a real problem on animal welfare grounds and various others. So they're looking back at the Jersey as being an easy managing cow that produces a high volume of milk, particularly in the modern Jersey does, and also high components, it's worth more to processors, and they're getting better profitability out of it. Have you found that in this country? Yes, I mean, clearly we've mostly been on Jersey farms, as you'd expect, um, but, but those people have had Jerseys, or some of them are in mixed farms, or they've got the Kiwi Cross as well. Um, the Kiwi Cross seems to be making quite a lot of ground over here. The Jersey element, I'd suggest, is the reason why it's making a lot of ground over here. Um, but they're also keeping more and more jerseys. So I think we're, it's a common theme throughout the world. Now, you're Secretary of the World Jersey Cattle Bureau. Can you just tell me what that particular position entails? Well, the World Jersey Cattle Bureau is the sort of umbrella organisation for all the Jersey breed associations around the world. And we've got about 34 members. Mm. And my, my role in that is one of coordination. We meet every year uh, in a different country. Every three years we have an international conference and we're delighted this year to be here in New Zealand. Um, and we, have, we work in a number of different areas. We, we're looking at uh, classification traits across countries and getting a better understanding of different systems and communicating that to Jersey breeders. Mm -hmm. But also we're looking at things that are breed improvement programs, how different countries can work together, particularly with regard to emerging technologies such as genomics. We need to sort of work together. We need to pool our population data in order that we can identify the best individuals and make the maximum progress within the breed. Now, of course, science is, is much more involved in breeding these days than it used to be, particularly with genomics. What sort of influence is it having on breeds such as yours? I think it's having a growing impact with everybody. Uh, I think all cattle breeders are, are paying attention to genomics. And I think it's fair to say that it's still relatively early days. Um, sort of feet in the welly boot farmers, um, perhaps looking at it with a bit more caution, 
there are many breeders I know that, that are embracing it fully and, and see it as, as the, the new uh, technology for the future. And it's certainly being talked about at our conference as being the, the greatest revolution in cattle breeding since the introduction of AB. Really? James Godfrey of the World Jersey Bureau there. I'll be back soon with our next show. Remember, you can catch up with the latest from Sector Report on our website. See you next week.